Hi everyone, Kareen Smith here again with another episode of Studying Thoreau, where I talk about resources that you can have to um, learn more about Henry's writings and uh, his life. And so today I am covering his other books. Yes, he did write something more than just Walden. Uh, there are others. Again, I'm not gonna cover interpretation, I leave that up to you. I'm talking about books here. As you know, I've been a Thoreau fan, Henry David Thoreau fan, since the 1970s. I worked as a librarian for a long time, and uh, for the last 20 years, I've specifically done a lot of Thoreau research. I've written two books about Henry, and I currently serve as the supervisor of the shop at Walden Pond for the Thoreau Society at Walden Pond State Reservation in Concord, Massachusetts. I am producing this series on my own. I want to be clear that my recommendations are my own, my opinions. There's going to be a lot of opinion in this episode, I guarantee you. Um, so when I voice my opinion, it doesn't necessarily represent the Thoreau Society. <clears throat> but if we sell the books at the shop, then we have made a conscious decision to do that. And for every episode that I mention books, I have a bibliography at www.travelswiththoreau.com. This one is under his other books. Um, this, the links will be either to the shop at Walden Pond or to bookshop.org, which benefits independent booksellers and which we are a part of, or uh, an aggregate website that shows you what used book dealers are currently selling. Those are for the out of print books. Now, as I said with Walden in the last video, when you're buying copies of these books for yourself, pay some attention to what you're actually getting. You have enough options now to make some conscious choices. So is it hardback or paperback? Is it basic or annotated? Does it have an introduction written by somebody who knows about the subject or who knows about Thoreau? Uh, was it released in a specific year to celebrate an anniversary? That might not be important to you, but it'll at least explain to you why so many books were printed in specific years. Uh, so these are some things to consider. How do you expect to use the book? You know, it's going to be yours. What do you want it to do if you want it to do anything? You want it to look pretty and sit on the shelf? That's a fair one. <laughs> That's a fair one. Um, but if you want to use it and you, and you, like I said, you have some conscious choices now. So let's get into this. Let's talk about the other books written by Thoreau, not Walden, not his journal, not correspondence, not specifically newer collections of essays and poems. And I'll get to all of those in later videos. So the very first book that we're going to talk about is A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. This is Henry's first book came out in 1849. This is the book that he moved to Walden to write. As you know, in 1839, Henry and his brother John paddled down the Concord River and up the Merrimack River to get into New Hampshire, and then they stowed the boat, and then they hiked around the, new, uh, the White Mountains in New Hampshire. They actually, and then they came back down, got the boat, paddled back, back home. Uh, the actual trip took two weeks, in uh, a week, he conflates it to one and then has chapters for each day, uh, begins with a Concord, a Concord chapter. Um, but he, he makes the two week into one in this book. Similarly, in the future, he will do that in Walden too, condensing the two years into one that begins in summer and then ends the following spring. Anyway, this is his first book it was his tribute to John, who died tragically in 1842 of tetanus, lockjaw. John had been his best friend, and they taught school together, and they explored nature together. They paddled up into New Hampshire. This book, however, did not sell very well. And you probably know this story, but it's a good one, and it is classic Thoreau. The publisher, which is named Monroe, printed a thousand copies of the first edition of a week in 1849. And even four years later, they had only gotten rid of 294 copies, either sold or given away as review copies. So in 1853, Monroe sent back 706 copies 
of the first edition of A Week to Henry. And uh, he famously carried all the boxes up to his attic bedroom uh, in the Yellow House on Main Street, which is where the family was living at the time. And then he wrote in his journal, I have now a library of nearly 900 volumes, over 700 of which I wrote myself. <laughs> Isn't that great? See, funny. Henry was a funny guy and not everybody pays attention to his humor. I don't understand why. If you want to look up that passage in his journal, it's dated October 28th, 1853. He talks a lot more about that. That's the, that's the sentence you hear a lot. But he talks a lot more about it, and he actually puts a positive spin on the experience. He actually says he's more inspired than ever before to keep on writing. Good for you, Henry. I'm not sure the rest of us would feel the same way. Um, and you also have to believe this is 19, 1853. He died in 1862. That means these boxes were there for the last eight, nine years of his life. I don't, I don't know that they moved them in another part of the build, the building. The house is pretty big, but <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Inspiration of boxes of unsold books. I'm not sure about that. So, what happened to those books anyway? Well, some of them most of them were repackaged with new covers and then sold after Henry died in 1862. And they were republished in a way by Tickner and Fields, his usual publisher, as it, as it turns out. And they were billed as a second issue of the first edition. So if you find a copy of a week that was released by Tickner and Fields in 1862, right after Henry died, you will know that the pages inside, at least, were ones that Henry carried up to his attic bedroom. I, th I think that's cool, I, I love that story. Should you read a week? There's a question. If you are a Thoreau fan, absolutely. Keep in mind that this is Henry's first book, and as a first-time author, he wanted to tell it all. So in addition to the journey of just the Concord and Merrimack Rivers and a little bit of the White Mountains, he talks about other things. He talks about how in 1844, he took a walkabout around New England and walked up to Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire and then over to Mount Greylock in Western Mass, then got on a train, met Ellery Channing, they went over to the Catskill Mountains in New York, came back. He also writes about his views about religion. Uh, he, this resulted in him offending at least one of his maiden aunts. So this is more than just a travel narrative. This is what Henry was thinking and doing in the early part of his life. So there are a variety of editions of a week. It's not as popular as Walden. Nothing is as popular of his as Walden. Uh, this is the Dover edition, the least expensive one you can get. Um, this one is from Penguin Classics. It has um, it has an introduction by Daniel Peck, who is a professor at SUNY Oneonta. Hi, Daniel. And this is the Princeton edition, the Princeton edition paperback. Princeton editions, again, are shorthand in Thoreau circles for the Princeton University Press project, where they go back to the original manuscripts and they reprint exactly as Henry punctuated and, and spelled and capitalized and all that kind of stuff. So this is the Princeton paperback, has a uh, introduction by American author John McPhee. This is uh, good because if you know John McPhee, he recreated part of this trip on the water himself and wrote a really good new ar article for the New Yorker about that, an extensive article. So that's why it makes sense that he wrote the introduction to a week. Now you know, I always say, I don't want to talk about interpretation. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divert from that for a moment. A week is not as popular, and it isn't written about as much as Walden and other things. So when you find something that's written about a week, it's kind of special. So I want to show you this book, The Rose Complex Weave, The Writing of a Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, um, by Professor Link Johnson, and it says, with the text of the first draft. 
This was released in 1986 by University Press of Virginia. Looks like it has the same look and feel as a Princeton edition hardback, okay? But it's not, I mean, even down to the, to the ruler on the, on the end pages, but it's not. But he talks a lot about the writing and about Henry at that time of his life early on as an early writer. And again, it, it, in the back of the book, it has the first draft in Henry's form. Now, this is kind of interesting. And one of the reasons why I'm showing you this is there are a lot of used copies of this book out there. And I have a link to them. And as a librarian, I decide, I, I kind of like good books to get good homes. So that's why I'm saying, if you want to know more about a week and you're interested in the writing process and in his drafts, the Rose Complex Weave, okay? You'll be able to get it from a used book dealer and actually it'll be cheaper than that Princeton paperback and that Penguin Peg paperback that I just showed you. There are, are a lot of them out there. By the way, no one's ever created a fully annotated version of a week, so there's a project for you if you want it. Okay, so there's a week, and then there was Walden, and those are the only books that Henry published in his lifetime. So he did write essays, of course, that got published in a variety of periodicals, including The Dial, the Transcendentalist periodical. But for the last year of his life, maybe even a little longer than the last year of his life, Henry and his younger sister, Sophia, went back to his manuscripts and they started preparing things for publication, knowing that that was probably going to be posthumous publication. Henry was suffering from consumption, tuberculosis. Uh, he knew his time was limited, obviously, and so they worked together to prepare things. So when he died in May of 1862, Sophia became his first literary heir, and she took over management of his manuscripts. And it is mainly because of her efforts, along with some other friends like Ellery Channing and Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Bronson Alcott a little, that we have additional books that Henry wrote, but he did not live to see, alas. And the first one of these, number two in our list today, is excursions. This is obviously a paperback, a newer paperback, but Excursions came out in 1863, and it is a collection of nine essays. That's the early uh, Rouse drawing of, of Henry, by the way. So it came out in 1863. It's a collection of nine, like I said, nine. Uh, and I want to read them to you, but I know, <laughs> can I find, I didn't put a bookmark in well, that was my fault. I didn't put a bookmark in. Um, there we go. Nine uh, essays, along with a biographical sketch written by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So the nine essays in this excursion are Natural History of Massachusetts, A Walk to Wachusett, The Landlord, A Winter Walk, The Succession of Forest Trees, Walking, Autumnal Tints, Wild Apples, and Night and Moonlight. So those are the essays in the original one of these excursions. This is a 1962 paperback, 1962 anniversary uh, year, and uh, it also includes an introduction by MIT professor Leo Marx, who famously wrote the book, The Machine in the Garden. So he knew what he was talking about. Do you need a copy of Excursions if you can find it? Probably not because all the essays in there are going to be in a compilation volume, like the portables that I showed you on the first episode. Um, the essays do come up in Thoreauvian conversations, though, so you should know about them. And they're travel and nature oriented, mostly, except for the landlord. They're, they're travel and nature oriented. That'll be good to know in about 20 minutes. Okay. So the next book that got published is The Maine Woods, published in 1864. And this is a collection of three essays that Thoreau wrote about his trips to Maine. He made three natural exploration trips to Maine. He, he was in Maine uh, other than that, but he made three specific trips to Maine, 1846, while he was living at Walden, 
1853 and 1857. I will talk a lot about his travels in other episodes. Of the three essays in here, two had been published earlier in periodicals while he was alive. The Katahdin essay was serialized in Sartain's Union Magazine of Literature and Art, and the Chess and Cook essay had been published in Atlantic Monthly. This was then when editor James Russell Lowell had the audacity to edit out Thoreau's comment about a pine tree going to heaven. Henry did not like it when people edited his material without his permission. And uh, so as a result, he never submitted anything else to Atlantic Monthly as long as James Russell Lowell was the editor. That's a story that goes along with this book. Should you read The Maine Woods? Probably, especially if you lived in or spent time in New England, but in any event, in any way, you very much should read the Katahdin essay somehow in this book or elsewhere, because this documents the time when Henry had an epiphany on top of the mountain, Katahdin in Maine, or what he thought was the top of the mountain. He had uh, an experience up there that changed his life. He found true wildness up there. That passage comes up again and again in Thoreauvian studies, and it's a pivotal, pivotal moment in his life. So it's good to know the context and good to know where it came from. The Lowell story comes up a lot too. So it's good to know what happened with that too. So here we've got Maine Woods. This is a penguin copy. It has uh, an introduction by American author Edward Hoagland. Um, this is the Princeton paperback, has an uh, introduction by uh, American writer Paul Theroux. And then um, Jeff Kramer, curator of Thoreau Institute at Walden Woods, did a fully annotated Maine Woods annotated edition, where again, <clears throat> when there's an annotated edition, you got the main text and then you got explanations for the references in the margins. By the way, uh, when I gave you recommendations about Walden. I told you about Scott Miller, photographer, and his uh, coffee table book of Walden. He also did one for the Maine Woods. It's out of print, and I don't have a copy, so I will link it up on my bibliography of how to get used copies of it. So there you go. A week, Maine Woods, excursions in the middle of that. And then we have, next up, Cape Cod. Cape Cod, published in 1865. This is a collection of 10 essays that, uh, or chapters that Henry gleaned from his trips to Cape Cod. He made a total of four trips to Cape Cod, 1849, 1850, 1855, and 1857. How does anybody think that this guy was a hermit? He was traveling all the time. And he took the train a lot too. That's a story for another time. So twice when he went to the Cape, he went with Ellery, twice he went on his own. After the second trip, he started to write essays and he started to give lectures on Cape Cod. And then in his habit, then he, he uh, made an attempt to get these lectures published in periodicals. So there are 10 in here. Only three of them appeared in the periodical Putnam's Monthly. And that's because editor George William Curtis had some problems with Thoreau's tone, evidently. Curtis had made some changes to the text and Thoreau reluctantly went along with them, evidently. But evidently, the same stories that Henry told to his audiences and that entertained them gleefully, as Mr. Emerson said, that people laughed until they cried when they'd heard these Cape Cod stories. Evidently, they didn't have the same effect on residents of the Cape when they read them. And some complained to Putnam's Monthly. So Curtis printed three of these chapters and sent the rest back to Henry. He must have been, uh, Henry, must have been dismayed and frustrated, so much so that soon after that, in, on September 14th, 1855, he wrote in his journal, it costs so much to publish, would it not be better for the author to put his manuscripts in a safe? Uh, Henry, I'm sorry, that's what happens when editors and get your stuff. No, I'm sorry you had to go through that. But 
Anyway, there are 10 essays in here. I think what he wrote about his fourth trip, which does not appear in Cape Cod, I kind of think the fourth trip is even more interesting because he took the train to Sandwich, he walked across the Cape to the Atlantic Ocean, he walked up to Highland Light, he walked over to Provincetown. It makes for great reading, but I digress, it's not in here. So not everything that he experienced about Cape Cod is in here. That's my story on that. And I will talk about his travels otherwise. Should you read Cape Cod? Sure, you could especially if you have your own re relationship with the Cape or if you are close to a dynamic ocean shoreline, you're gonna find common ground in here. Um, some scholars have said that it's the lightest, lightheartest, most lighthearted and humorous book Thoreau ever wrote. Well, yes, he was a funny guy, okay? Shipwrecks and whale beachings aside, he was a funny guy. And it's not all nature. He's talking about the people that he meets out there too. It's a whole different world than, than Concord, that's for sure. So here's a penguin, an older penguin copy. Uh, this has introductions by both Edward Hogan and Paul Theroux in it. Um, here's the Princeton edition. And this has an introduction by Robert Pinsky, former poet laureate of our country. And again, Scott Miller has a coffee table book on Cape Cod that you could get to. So there we go. We're up to me talking a little bit more about, about Henry's travels. So we got a week, we got Maine woods, we got Cape Cod, rivers and mountains, a variety of habitats and environments. These were not vacations that Henry was taking, you know. These were excursions, as he called them. Deliberate ones, deliberately going to other places and seeing what the nature was like there and seeing how the people lived there. And um, see how it was different from Concord and the fields and forests and streets that he saw every day around his hometown. He searched for wildness, he searched for the unusual, and then he documented whatever he saw. And then, uh, you know, when he wrote about it and when it got published, then we could read a little bit about it and we could experience a little bit about that ourselves, especially if we were prompted by that to go and find it ourselves. And one of the most unusual places that he went to was in Quebec in 1850 with his friend Ellery. I mean, Quebec, it looks medieval. There are walls and stone forts and soldiers in his time and Catholic churches, which he'd never seen before and people who only spoke French and no English. How could this even be? You know, Concord and Quebec City were both founded in the early 1600s, only 23 years apart. How could they be so different? and they're still different now. And they're only 400 miles apart in a straight line. <laughs> uh, so we have, in 1866, a Yankee in Canada with anti-slavery and reform papers. This is the last collection that Sophia oversaw for publication. And it contains yeah, a Yankee in Canada, five chapters that he wrote, five essays that are chapters that he wrote after his time. Did a lot of research on Canada and exploration to write them. And then it's paired with 10 uh, essays. Now, I don't know the full publication story here, uh, but we got a Yankee in Canada and we got 10 essays thrown in. I have a feeling that Tickner and Fields looked at the manuscripts and said, you know what? Yankee in Canada is too short to be a book on its own. These 10 essays are too short to be a book on their own, but maybe, you know, we put them together, maybe they'll sell. I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm wondering if that was the case. So what I have to show you here is a second edition of the book, and I borrowed it from the Fitchburg Public Library of Fitchburg, Massachusetts. A shout out to director Sharon Bernard and all of her terrific staff. They do a great job and uh, allowed me to take out their second edition of A Yankee in Canada. Okay, and so here's the table of contents. But before I read you the names of the 10 essays in here, I wanna pause for this historic moment because this publication, the original one in 1866, marks the exact moment, my friends, when Henry Thoreau's essay called Resistance to Civil Government, 
and that he got published by Elizabeth Peabody in her single run issue of Aesthetic Papers in 1849, when that essay gets a new title. And the new title is, say it with me friends, Civil Disobedience. Who came up with that? Who came up with that phrase? Henry didn't come up with that phrase. It's not in the essay at all. And this you can check for yourself because with electronic searching, you know, you can find a word, go out, go online, find an electronic copy of civil disobedience, look for civil, look for disobedience. Is it in there? Civil is in there three times and he's quoting somebody else for a fourth or a fifth, but civil's only in there three times. Disobedience is in there twice. They're never together, not even close. So who came up with civil disobedience as the phrase? Evidently somebody at Tickner and Fields, you know? And resistance to civil government, it was the original title. You know, resistance and disobedience are two very different approaches to challenging authority. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that whoever came up with that probably never did either. That's my opinion. Okay, somebody made Henry the poster child for civil disobedience for the rest of his reputation days, and it wasn't him. At least we don't think it was him. Did he tell Sophia and Ellery to change it? I can't imagine. Did they change it? I can't imagine, but then I don't know them personally. But I can't imagine that they would have come up with that. I think it was a publisher opinion now, but this is one of the mysteries of publication. I think it was a publisher who said, you know, resistance to civil government doesn't sound good enough. Let's bump this up a level and call it civil disobedience. So if you can see there, you can see that the third one is civil disobedience. Okay. So the 10 essays in here are slavery in Massachusetts, prayers, civil disobedience, a plea for Captain John Brown, paradise to be regained, herald of freedom, Thomas Carlyle and his works, Life Without Principle, Wendell Phillips Before the Conquered Lyceum, and The Last Days of John Brown. Okay, historical note number two. Second essay is called Prayers. Henry Thoreau did not write that. It's an Emerson essay. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that for the dial, and well, it appeared in the dial in July of 1842. Um, now, there might have been some, some, and it was uncredited, okay? So it didn't say that R.W. Emerson wrote that. It was uncredited. Um, but in his essay, Prayers, he quotes several people, and, and three of these are verses. And the first one's from Shakespeare. The second verse set of verses is from somebody I can't even figure out. The third one is from a poem that Henry wrote. There it is. Now here's a, an easy tip, friends. In Henry's own writings, when he quotes himself in poems, he does not put quotation marks because it's all his narration, all right? You go in Walden, some of the poems that he threw into Walden, and a week has poems in it too. His poems are ones that do not have quotes in front of them. This one has quotes in front of each verse. So Emerson is quoting somebody. He's, Emer he's quoting Thoreau. Now, again, I don't know the whole publication history of this, but someone made a mistake. And it could have been as easy as somebody pointing to a 24-year-old copy of the dial and saying, did Thoreau write this? And somebody saying yes, but the person pointed to the poem and not to the whole essay. Who even knows? Did <laughs> Did uh, Sophia and Ellery even see a mock-up of this book? These are two major, these are two major guffs in this book. I don't even know. I don't even know. So um, this is the second edition. This is from 1874. And by then Tickner and Fields had evolved into James Osgood. So obviously the marketing they didn't call it that then, that they did was good enough to keep on selling the book. And this is how civil disobedience gets out there and publicized. And this is how eventually Gandhi gets to read it and Martin Luther King Jr. gets to read it and everybody else gets to read it because it appeared 
in a book, not because of Elizabeth Peabody's aesthetic papers, because that was just a one-time thing. It came out because of this book. So it is a good thing, okay? But there's so many mysteries about this, and, and oh, who even knows? So who wrote civil disobedience? Students, if your teachers ask you that, you have good cause to say, not Henry David Thoreau. You can prove that, probably. Okay, so the 10 essays in here are, I told you that. Why am I going backward? <laughs> okay, so those were the 10 essays. Let's go back to Yankee in Canada. Yankee in Canada is five chapters, as I said. And again, Henry followed this, this format. He went somewhere, he started researching about it, he wrote, he wrote about it, he started giving lectures about it, and then he wanted to get the articles published. Okay, so that's what he did with his essays about Quebec. And so he enlisted the help of Horace Greeley, his friend who was the editor of the New York Tribune, and Greeley looked for places to have those things published too, and he landed on Putnam's Monthly Magazine, again, of American Literature, Science, and Art. This actually happened before whoops, for you, before the Cape Cod incident, okay? And George William Curtis, the editor, the same editor. So, Putnam's Monthly started to publish these five essays, and they got most of the way through the third one, when guess what happened? <laughs> I think you can probably guess. George William Curtis took out two sentences that Henry wrote about the Catholic Church. And they weren't really necessarily criticisms, and they were actually kind of making fun of himself for not knowing that much about the Catholic Church and, and saying it as an outsider. But George William Curtis thought that somebody could be offended. Ha! Guess what? He was right. Somebody was offended, and it was Henry. So Henry said, eh, bring, me, bring me all my stuff back. So, so it only got serialized, like two and three quarters of the five in there got serialized and the rest had to wait for a publication. I'm going to talk about this one in a minute. Should you read A Yankee in Canada? You could. Um, you know, it's not necessarily, excuse me, a high priority. Uh, if you have ever visited Quebec, I think you should. If you are Catholic, I think you should. And you just have to read it with an open mind and realize that he's seen it as an outsider and he's, he doesn't know how to you know, he's going into a Notre Dame cathedral in Montreal and not necessarily knowing what's up. I'm actually working on a new edition of uh, A Yankee in Canada that I hope will um, remedy some of the issues around it. I hope it um, is attractive to people on both sides of the border. And I'm also going to include directions for um, following in Henry and Ellery's path, because that's kind of cool. But there are a variety of Yankee books out there that still have the 10, sent, the 10 essays in them. Um, make sure, well, you can, you can check that out. I just bought this one, A Yankee in Canada, um, paperback. Uh, I bought it because I wanted to, it it's only has a Yankee and a lot of the other paperbacks that are out there have all those essays too. I only wanted a Yankee and I wanted to read the foreword by Richard Fleck. Um, he's a, a former professor who in the past wrote about Thoreau and also about John Muir's interactions with the Native Americans, both, both of them separately. And um, so I wanted to see what he said about Quebec. And this is okay. It's print on demand. So, you know, it looks like print on demand and has the text and the introduction's okay. It, it's based on a on a lecture that he gave in the 80s, it's okay. But did you know there was a but coming? But here's the thing. Thoreau people read a lot and they learn a lot and they begin to know a lot. And then they kind of expect others to know as much or everything. And then they start to find mistakes, and when you find mistakes, it's not like they, they go out to find them, usually. But when you find a mistake, you kind of call it out. So, <laughs> you knew this was coming. So yeah, like it's a print on demand, so they're doing it quick, probably, okay? So there's this picture on the cover, 
and I wanted to see what it was. Didn't look familiar to me, um, but I, I, on the back of the title page, it has a description and it has the citation of where they, it came from, the archive that it came from. And evidently it is a depiction, a photograph or a daguerreotype or, or one, one of those processes that was taken of Montreal in 1851. Now this is cool because Ellery and Henry were there in the September of 1850. So this is probably as close as we can get to what Montreal looked like. An example of what Montreal looked like, I'm sure there are others. But the description in, on the title page confused me because it said clearly that you could see three churches in this picture. I only see one, this big one. I only see one. And, and it's not continued on the back. So I was confused. And I don't like to be confused. So I looked online for the citation. Came up right away. It's posted on Wiki Commons with that exact same description about the three churches and it names the other two and then it says this is a cathedral. Well, <clears throat> no, <laughs> basically, no. And one of these days I'm gonna log into Wiki, Wiki Commons and change that and make it more accurate because the other two and this one, you just compare this to a, a, a street map of Montreal. This is St. Patrick's Church. This is not the Notre Dame Cathedral now Basilica, that Henry and Ellery went in. So if, if they were trying for a period depiction of Montreal, fine. But the silent implication by saying that it's a cathedral, and I think it says A and not the, means that it sort of seems as though that's where Henry and Ellery walked in to experience a cathedral. Oh, it does say the. It says the cathedral. No, it's not the cathedral. I can tell you that right now. Notre Dame, is, Notre Dame is not not in this picture. And I got offended by this slightly, but <laughs> I mean, that's just the way we are. Um, but in looking at it for more than a day, I started thinking, you know, this angle of this photograph, the photographer had to be up. This is not a street level photograph. The photographer had to be up and had to be up two or three stories over these single floor houses. Actually, they have gables, so they're actually one and a half. The photographer had to be up. And you look at a road map of Montreal, the photographer may have been in one of the towers of the Notre Dame Cathedral, which is where Henry and Ellery were. Now, if someone had done their homework and researched that, I would have loved it. <laughs> I would have loved it. Um, but as it is, eh, okay, not so much. Um, if you want a French edition from Quebec that is in the kind of vernacular that they speak in Quebec, this is what you need to look for so far, okay? I'm hoping to remedy that, but so far, this is Un Yankee au Canada. Came out in 1962, anniversary year. And uh, it has a uh, translation by Adrian Therian and an introduction by publisher Maynard Gertler. I had to look that up. It was published in Montreal. Um, you can see the credits there. I'm not going to try to speak the French because I can't. Um, but you can find used copies of this occasionally. I will link it up. But right now when I looked, there was only one out there. Okay, so, but that, that's the most accurate one in Canadian French, according to our friends, uh, Jean Clotier and Jacques Delorme. So that's a Yankee in Canada, but of course this book was consisted of the Yankee in Canada and then those 10 essays. What has happened to those 10 essays? Like I said, you can probably find, well, I may not have said, you can probably find them in a compilation volume. But the way that the Princeton editions have dealt with the 10 essays. First of all, they took out prayers since Emerson wrote it. And uh, they added a couple of other things, uh, other obscure Thoreau essays, and I'm not gonna list. But they made the hardback edition of the Princeton edition reform papers, and they just put the essays in there. They put Yankee aside for the time, but put the 10 essays in there. 
when they printed the paperback edition of that, they called it the higher law, which sounds kind of more enticing than reform papers. And both have an introduction by historian, uh, American historian Howard Zinn. I stuttered a little bit over that. And both of them have an introduction by Howard Zinn. Okay. And so they took out prayers, they added a couple of other things, and they restored the name of the essay to resistance to civil government. Okay. So that's a Yankee in Canada and uh, the Reform Papers, sort of. And what I forgot. <laughs> okay, so Princeton still had Yankee in Canada left over. What did they do with it? They went back and they stuck it into excursions. Okay, so if you get the Princeton edition of excursions, it's like the first one that I showed you before. I showed you a little paperback before. But Yankee, and they, those were essays, nature and um, you know, travel oriented. So Yankee in Canada goes really well in here. So they put Yankee in Canada in excursions. So that's the bottom line. If you get the Princeton edition of excursions, it also includes Yankee in Canada. What they did with the reform papers is they made them a separate volume. Okay. You know, Sophia and Ellery could have <laughs> could have helped us out there and done this 150 years ago and divided the two and put Yankee in Canada in excursions, but maybe they hadn't really thought of it that way. I don't know. I'm not their friend. I don't know. But anyway, you know, it must have given Henry a great deal of satisfaction and comfort in his last days, in his last year to sit down with his sister Sophia and talk about these things and say, okay, here are my manuscripts. This is what I want to have happen. The three on Maine should go together. The 10 on Cape Cod should go together. The five on Yankee should go together. Um, you know, they worked on other, other essays too, <clears throat> which is why we have walking in life without principle. They weren't published in his lifetime. But anyway, um, they, they could sit down and figure that all out. And he obviously trusted Sophia to be able to do the right thing after he was gone. And evidently, as much as we can tell, she did as much as she could. And um, as his first literary heir, she was, you know, tying up all the loose ends and helping to grow and establish his literary reputation. None of them would know where it would lead, obviously. But, you know, she she did as best as she could. So uh, so congratulations to her. And I would not be talking about these books if she hadn't done that, at least not in this format. Maybe someone else would have done something differently. I think they should have looked at the proofs of that last book. Anyway, those are the books that Henry wrote and that Sophia and Ellery edited. And then 125 years go by and the Rose Scholars are still looking at the mass of Henry's manuscripts. And there's, there's a big pile of nature observations that looks like Henry bound them together at one point and called them wild fruits, but some of the papers have gone in other places. And I'll explain what happens to the manuscripts totally in another, another couple of episodes. And I'm paraphrasing here, but <clears throat> couldn't we do some more with this nature stuff? So, in 1993, it fell to Bradley P. Dean, a Thoreau scholar, to bring out Faith in a Seed, the first publication of Thoreau's last manuscript, Faith in a Seed. And so what this is, is according to his table of contents, it's dispersion of seeds, along with other late natural history writings called wild fruits, weeds and grasses, and forest trees. So, you know, you know Henry was big on nature observations. Now you know, maybe, that people didn't always know how plants and trees got established. They didn't know how they reproduced. They thought at one point, probably, that it was divine intervention that that particular plant grew in that particular patch and didn't really think about how they reproduce. But Henry, of course, keeping his meticulous observations, in addition to figuring out when things bloomed and what colors the trees made in the autumn, figured out as much as he could about different species and how they reproduced. Did they have seeds or fruits? And how were those distributed? Um, did an animal eat one and then nicely place it with fertilizer somewhere else? 
Did an animal walk past a plant and get it attached, the seed attached to him and distribute it somewhere along the way? Did the wind come and blow the, blow the seeds away? Did the parent plant just poof, drop it where it was and they all grew up underneath it? This is what he wrote. This is what he, what he made observations about. And this is a narrative, okay? It's not just statistics because he it didn't write it like that. Thoreau didn't write it like that. Now, um, so that's what this is. And um, it features the illustrations from botanical illustrator and <clears throat> Massachusetts artist, Abigail Rohr, R-O-R-E-R. -R -E and she's done a, a number of um, books with Brad. And she's just amazing, amazing. And not only, not only, uh, individual species, but also habitats. And she also, yeah, I should have put a bookmark in there. She also did this depiction of the 1861 ambrotype that Henry sat for in August of 1861 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And I actually got Abby's permission to use this on the cover of my first book, Westward I Go Free. So thanks, Abby. Beautiful, beautiful. And we had never had Henry's seed dispersion observations in a book like this before. But you know, when you write a book, you learn a lot as you're doing it. And then you learn a lot after it's out. So in 2000, Brad put out Wild Fruits, Bradley P. Dean, put out Wild Fruits, The Rose Rediscovered Last Manuscript. Came out seven years after Faith in a Seed. He had gone through and realized, you know, the, the introduction that I did for that might not have been the introduction that Henry expected. It might have been that other essay called Wild Fruits in there. And, you know, it might be better if we, um, if we organize this with headings of the species, it'll be easier to read. Still illustrations by Abigail Rohr. Nice map of Concord on the end papers. Abigail Rohr and uh, Bradley P. P. Dean, Wild Fruits. So most, it seems like most of Faith in a Seed is, is in Wild Fruits. By the way, different illustrations by Abby in this one than in Faith in a Seed. So should you read Faith in a Seed, and Wild Fruits. You know, if you really love to read what Henry wrote about nature, sure, absolutely. Um, you might want to start with Wild Fruits, since that seems to be the more complete one, um, but you might want both, okay? Especially for Abby's illustrations. I know I keep talking about illustrations, but you know, I think they're important too. So technically speaking, those are all of Henry's other books to date. And again, I'm to, in order for you to purchase them or find them, I'm putting links on travelswiththoreau.com on my, on my website. Um, and, you know, it's up to you. And you can find all of these in a library too, of course. So those are Henry's other books. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Studying Thoreau. I'm going to keep on going. And in the next episode, it's time to talk about the journal. It'll be fun. Thanks very much again for watching. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the channel, put a thumbs up down there below uh, or uh, write a comment. If you know more about some of these than I do, that'd be great. Um, or ring the bell and you'll get notifications. So until next time, I'm Kareen Smith. Have a terrific day. I can't stop it.